Okay guys, video four in my engine out series on the 355 and it is actually finally time to do the belt portion of our belt service on the 355. So yes, we're gonna be installing the belts on the 355 today, uh, but it's not that easy. We have to do a couple other things too. We need to set the timing and verify that the timing is all set up as well as reseal the valve cover. So this is probably the most intimidating portion of doing it because everybody started that or scared that when they start their car, they're just gonna ram all their little you know valves into the pistons and ruin their motor and so i'm here to put your mind at ease a little bit it's not that hard in fact it's it can be very simple especially if you do it the ferrari way now there's a lot of controversy over how to do it you know do you do the low center line method do you, do you use center dwell do you use first method blah blah anyway we're going to be doing it by the book and then i'm going to show you how i verify it with the other methods that are available. And it's 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 really gonna be hopefully surprisingly easy. I'm gonna try to make it as easy as I can explain it. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we're here on the driver's side of the motor. I'm gonna take this valve cover off and then we're gonna show you how to do the timing on there. So a couple things before you start, obviously you're gonna be opening up the engine. So when you do that, you just need to make sure that you're being very clean. Uh, so I went ahead and I blew everything off and I kind of wiped down all this stuff because you don't want any dirt or contaminants going into the motor. So. Another good thing before you start is just go and print up the sheet of all the torque specs. They're in the workshop manual. I think they start on page 86 because you're going to need to reference those quite a bit. So, and with it off the idle air thing, it just slides right out. The next part is there are four hoses that go from your intake to your throttle bodies. It also makes a lot more room if you just unplug the injectors and then just kind of scoot them over to the side. Now we're just going to start undoing the 10 millimeter acorn nuts. Before the valve cover comes off on the back of each camshaft on one side, there's a vacuum pump on the other side is your camshaft position sensor. Both of those are going to have to come off before we can take the valve covers off. You definitely have to use like a stubby wrench to get to these bolts. You can just set this to the side. Now we're ready to pull our valve cover. So actually one last thing before you pull your head off, there's a uh, very thin washers underneath those nuts. And uh, inevitably, just Murphy's Law, if you pull the valve cover off, one of these is probably going to fall inside your head. So I'm going to go ahead and pop them all off with a magnet first. I think this guy ends up in almost all my videos. So uh, he's just a plastic squeegee. And I've had good luck kind of jamming him just in the corners just to break the seal. There it goes. Valve cover's off. Now with both valve covers off, what we're gonna do is go ahead and start doing the belts too. To replace the seals, these gears have to come off on either side. And that means that we need to start by taking off the crank bolt. So an impact with a 36 millimeter, usually get it off. Now these are not pressed on, so they actually, there we go, just slides off. Now that we have the crank hub off, we can kind of inspect our front main seal and to make sure it's not leaking. Uh, this actually is very dry. This seems to be just a little bit of road grime. I'm not worried about that at all. Another common leaking point is the two gears. And so uh, if you need to replace these, this would be the time to do it because you got to do a whole belt job to do it. Cool thing I think just to look at, it's just a, I love looking at this. So here you go, you have the intake cam, the exhaust cam. These are the three valves per each intake and the two valves per each exhaust. I just think that's so cool to look at how it works and everything like that. All right guys, we got the valve cover off and the crank pulley off. So it's time to actually start doing the work here. The very first thing we're gonna do is establish top dead center. I can't stress this enough. This is the most important measurement you're gonna take. So spend a little extra time maybe getting it right because all your other measurements are gonna be based off of this one. So uh, real quick, let's talk about the tools I'm gonna be using. You're gonna need a degree wheel. You can actually print these online, but it's better to just to get a metal one. Uh, you can use this to turn the crank, the crankshaft bolt, but um, you know, the 36 millimeter socket is like two pounds and you guys know I never wear shoes, so it always falls off. So I have a crankshaft socket and this thing makes it really easy to do all the measurements. Uh, in addition to that, you're gonna need just a, you know, a digital micrometer. You can use a analog one, but the digital ones are not that much more expensive. And then you're gonna need a hanger to make some little parts and stuff. And I'll show you that in a second. So the first thing we're gonna need to do is mount this somewhere. And everything on here is basically aluminum, so there's nowhere to mount. So what you're gonna need to do is just take a little 16 inch piece of steel, uh, cut a little notch, and we're just gonna simply attach that to the uh, valve cover bolt. 
and screw it down and that'll give us a nice place to mount everything. So you're going to need some stiff wire or something that goes down into the cylinder to touch the piston. Uh, on this side, I filed it down so it's really smooth. You can touch it on your lip. As long as it doesn't cut you, it's not going to hurt anything down there. And uh, the cool thing about these rubber lined or plastic lined hangers is they kind of can actually thread right into your device. So what we're going to do is go in and stick this down into the cylinder. Alright, so you can see I've got my uh, base set up here and it's set up. The goal here is it has to be completely 90 degrees. So you can see that we are straight up and down here, straight up and down on this way. And then another thing you gotta check on is just to make sure that it's not touching any of the spark plug threads. So it goes right down on the cylinder and uh, we're ready to get started. So I got two cameras set up here, one on the uh, gauge so you guys can see it. And then I'm gonna go ahead and get my crank pulley set up here. So these things just kind of slide on. I'm going to take off one of these timing cover bolts. I'm going to install one of these pointers I made right onto that bolt. Then install our degree wheel. All right, degree wheels installed, crank sockets installed. We got a camera up there trying to monitor that, and I'll try to put that on the screen next to you. We're ready to find top dead center. So the direction of the travel of the motor is going to be clockwise. Uh, it is okay to go backwards if you ever need to. Just if you do, kind of overshoot it a little bit because it takes a little bit of the slack out of the belts. But uh, I wouldn't recommend going counterclockwise for a long amount of time. So what we're going to do is I know that these marks on here are actually uh, top dead center. So what I'm going to do is get it close within maybe a few degrees. And then we're going to zero out our gauge up here. So now what in theory it is, is as I get up, near the top of the travel, we're gonna remember that number. So that's an arbitrary number right now. So as you see, uh, we're almost at three, 2.99, three, come on, three. All right, so you saw it went to about 3.45, and that was where we peaked. Now we just went past it. So. Let me explain kind of the controversy that I talked about at the beginning of the first video. So um, when the piston gets up near the top, it goes very, very slowly as the crank is coming around. So sometimes it's very hard to tell when exactly is top. In fact, a lot of people assume there's about three degrees of dwell, which means the cranks actually turn three degrees when that gauge has reached its peak and come back down. And so a lot of people will take the average of it and say that's top dead center. Uh, Ferrari says no, you need to do it on the very first time it hits the highest number. So on this one it hit 3.45 millimeters uh, and they're gonna say that even though that it stays at that 3.45 for like a degree or two. And um, so there's a lot of arguments back in there. Here's my opinion. In a perfect world with perfect instrumentation, you should be able to, no matter how finite it is, you should be able to detect top dead center. Uh, but we're not running a perfect world. There's bearings inside here which have a couple thousands clearance on the crank, the pin, the rod, and everything like that. Uh, so what happens is, let me use a bolt for example. Let's say that this is just the piston pin. Remember there's, there's a couple things. As the crank is pushing it up, it's up at the top. As it reaches the top, the crank starts to go down and this stays in place for a second before it starts pulling it down. Now we're talking about tens of thousands of inches but that causes the dwell. So in theory, when it hits the top, that is the top, then the slack is taken out of the bearings and it starts to come down. So it'll actually pause there just for a second, just because of the bearings. Remember, the bearings really don't have a whole lot of oil pressure, or they don't have any oil pressure right now. It's, uh, so anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and use the, the first time it hits that peak number. So now that I've established top dead center on my gauge, I'm actually, even off camera, I checked it three times and I would suggest doing the same. I'm gonna check it one more time now with the gauge in thousandths of an inch and try to show you uh, what I mean about the dwell. So if we go through it, as we get closer to the top, you're gonna see now that we are two degrees, almost two degrees before, gauge is on 134 and a half. We'll go a little more, 135 at about one and a half. Here we are at one. 135.5, so that's kind of our, hopefully our peak. Go a tiny bit more, half a degree. Okay, so we're at top dead center now, still showing 135. We'll go half degree past, still hasn't moved. A full degree past, 
still hasn't moved two degrees past boom and we're back down so here's a way that i can back up that theory of the bearings are what's messing with the dwell and the bearings causing it uh, so if we go backwards the same thing's going to happen so here we are so remember how when we were at this point going the other way the gauge was a lot higher so here we are at one degree almost one degree after gauge is shown 133 there's about a half degree one degree for 134 okay so right at zero 134.5 Still at zero, 134.5. Let's go one degree past. So remember, it was still going up at this point when we were turning it clockwise. So now going counterclockwise, it's dwelling further. So here we are, almost two degrees on the other side, and the gauge hasn't moved. It's still at its kind of its peak. There we go, and then it finally drops back down about three. So remember guys, the argument is when some people think that it's just undetectable, what I'm saying is that the, the play in the bearings when it's going up, reaches the top, the bearing the crank starts to come down and then it moves and that's causing the dwell. So when we went backwards and forwards, we are able to verify it. So I am confident in my top dead center uh, reading. So we're gonna not mess with this at all, not touch the needle. Now we can go ahead and move on. All right guys, so now that we've got top dead center established, it's safe to start disassembling our motor, but we can just double check that our ticks here, here, also here, and here all line up. Last thing I wanna do is just go ahead and mark the belts so we know which way they came off. This actually isn't necessary because we're gonna be setting the timing, but just so we don't have to like do a lot of guesswork, we know exactly how the belts came off because uh, the timing should be set up good right now. Next thing we're gonna do before moving the belt is to get off the cam bolt. So we wanna leave the belt on for this because we don't want them to spin. If you spin these, uh, the cam will spin and open a valve and you could bend the valve. So we wanna keep the cams exactly where they go. So they do make an expensive tool that kind of pinches right here. Uh, I'm not joking, the Ferrari method is just to use vice grips. Um, I don't necessarily like the vice grips because if you put a lot of pressure on here, they will deflect. So I kind of use a modified Ferrari method. I'll jam a washer in there that's exactly the right size between the gears and then put the vice grips on there. That way there's no deflection at all in the gears. And I'm not kidding, I'll show you a picture of this in the manual. That way we can loosen these bolts. Now to take the belt off, we need to lock the tensioner in place. They make a pin for these that comes in with them new. You can usually use just a 16 inch drill bit and it'll slide right in. If it doesn't go all the way through, uh, sometimes you can just turn this after you have it loosened and get it to go all the way through. But you definitely want to put that in there because if you don't, this thing's just gonna come shooting out. Now we've slid the catch all the way in there and we can remove the pulley the rest of the way out. Now our belt is free to remove. Don't throw it away yet because we're gonna need it. With the belt out of the way, we wanna inspect the arm that holds the pulley, make sure it moves freely, and then go ahead and further inspect your tensioner to make sure it's in good shape. You wanna make sure there's no oil leaking out of it uh, or any heavy rust. Now we can go ahead and loosen our cam gears, or I'm sorry, cam pulleys. Now go ahead and leave it on there for now because we gotta make one more mark. With the bolt out, we have the hole marked on the pulley, but not on the actual camshaft. So we're gonna say that it lines up with this guy right there. And now we're, now with both of them marked, we can just gently slide them off. Next thing we're gonna do is go ahead and loosen these and remove our seals. And now we can just pull the seals out and go and replace these, as well as the O-ring that's on here. And while we're on the subject of doing the seals, I'll show you just kind of what parts you get when you do these. So generally the seal kits come in all in a package that comes with every seal you need for the whole job. Uh, in addition to that, uh, go ahead and get new spark plugs. I went ahead and uh, decided that because of my car and the mileage uh, and on the original tensioners, even though they're looking great shape, I'm gonna go ahead and do uh, new tensioners just because it's cheap insurance. We got the brand new belts here. Uh, then, 
some new exhaust gaskets this is the accessory belt pulley and like i said at the beginning of the video we're going to do the new exhaust bolts on there uh, the accessory belts and then i also bought an upgraded uh, hose kit um, just because it's always a good idea to replace all those hoses since you can only get to them when the motor's out anyway let's go ahead and get this seal replaced and all back together we're going to put a thin layer of oil in that new seal now we're going to put our new seals in so we've cleaned up this area with alcohol and any previous gasket is gone new seals in place we've put a little oil on it and a new o-ring i've also put a little bit of anaerobic uh, gasket maker just on the outside area and also note when you install these seals they are directional there's little arrows on them just make sure you get a good seat reinstall the cam gears a little bit of oil on the threads make sure you line up your marks because there is a recess on this washer for the dowel I'm going to remove the old tensioner So these are, they have a spring in them. So unless that spring breaks, uh, they really can't fail other than just getting rust or leaking the oil out. Cause I think they're oil dampened with a mechanical spring, but still 1998, uh, it's, it's time. I think one thing that surprises me about this is there's only lock. The only place the motor calls for Loctite is just on the crank bolt, uh, nowhere else. So. We got our new tensioners that come sealed. Make sure you install it with a spring washer. So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to take the old belt and put it back on one more time for us to torque down these bolts. We're going to temporarily set the tension on the belt just for the tightening. Put our wash back in there. Again, the Ferrari approved method. I'm serious. And this one with oil on the threads is 98 Newton meters. So the seals and O-rings are now replaced. We've used the old belt to torque these. And so now we are actually done with the old belt. So it is time to remove it so um, if anything ever goes wrong and uh, like something moves or something like that and you freak out all you need to do is just set it up again at top dead center if you line up those marks in top dead center here you're good so I pulled the old belt off and uh, I have made marks on there if you remember at the beginning and uh, you technically you don't need it you can just slap the belt on there it's all lined up nothing's moved but just for redundancy I kind of transferred them to the new belt so now we can carefully install the new belt. One thing you want to be mindful of is just these belts. Uh, you don't want to get any oil or gasoline or anything on them. So now that you got a new belt on there, keep it really clean. So when installing, we just kind of want to make sure this is the tight side. And as you wrap it around, you'll see that it attaches there snugly here. There we go. Kind of make sure it's nice and centered on there. And we reinstall our tensioner again. All right, so now we're to the part where we're gonna be tensioning the belt, or the, the manual says to stretch the belt. So uh, we have the pin in here. Right now we can't remove it because there's a lot of tension on there. There's a gap, a smaller gap here, that roughly with the pin in there is roughly two millimeters. So with the pin out, we need it kind of just to extend just slightly. So what we're gonna do is, they do make a special tool, but there's really absolutely no need for it. Almost everybody on the forum uses pliers, and you can get plenty of movement just with these. And the way I found it best is just kinda of take up the tension on the belt, just enough that you can get the pin sliding. Right when it's at that point, that's when we're gonna go ahead and cinch it down. Just make it snug. We might be on the slightly too loose side right now. We're going to go back just a tiny bit. So now I got just a little bit of friction on there and that's where I found it's perfect. So when I pull it out, it's going to extend just a little bit. And now what I'm going to do is just double check that we're still on top dead center. We're still on our marks. So we're going to go and run the motor around one time. I 
then we're going to measure and see if we have 2.5 millimeters here. And we got 2.45. So that is perfectly in spec. So now it is time to torque that down. So now brand new belt, tensioner pulley, and tensioner all installed. We're going to actually move on to the timing. So here we go. All right, new belt, new tensioner, new pulley, all installed, all torqued down. We're, uh, we're now ready to just verify the timing. So this is when we need our gauge, and we're going to set it up now with just a little bit of a bent thing because it's got to get around the lobe and onto the tablet. So we're going to start with the intake, and um, I'll go and get this put on there. So let me show you real quick how I got it rigged up. So we're 90 degrees this way. We're 90 degrees this way. Uh, with the intakes, you can't use the middle one. You got to use the first or back one. So I use the first one, and obviously you just kind of a little tedious to get it down there on the tablet, but away from the lobe. Make sure the lobe doesn't hit it when it spins around. All right, so we're ready to start. All right, so let's do a real quick cliff notes of what we're actually doing. So we're just verifying that the lobes on the cam are opening the valves exactly when they're supposed to be doing. So there are several ways to do that. It's really hard for it to, you know, a lobe is kind of a oblong shaped object. It's really hard to tell exactly when it starts opening. So they'll use a point. And in this case, they use the reference for top dead center. And they say that when it comes around, when it opens at 2.41 millimeters on the intake, that's when it, it lines up with top dead center. As it continues to open, it opens all the way and comes back down. So for the exhaust, we're gonna measure on the closing side at 2.29 millimeters. And so that's the Ferrari method, and it's really, really easy to figure out. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna back it up with method number two, and that is we're gonna to try to do lobe center line. So lobe center line is when that lobe comes around, and it's at its very peak, we're gonna to try to determine that by taking a measurement on either side. So anyway, I realize I just threw out a bunch of numbers and you're like, woo, 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 but listen, when you watch it, I think you're gonna understand it. So just pay attention and you'll kind of get it. Okay, so up top here, we have our gauge set on the number one tablet on the intake, and I'm gonna show you how easy this is to do it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spin the motor around clockwise. So you can see the intake valves are coming around. So what it is is right now we have the gauge zeroed out so the valve is completely closed. What we're gonna do is we're gonna spin it around. And in the Ferrari manual, it says that we need to open the valve 2.41 millimeters. And when it's, it is properly timed when 2.41 millimeters lines up with top dead center. So I'm gonna slowly move it around. The valve's gonna start opening about now. We're gonna keep moving this around until we see 2.41 on the gauge. So the valve is opening, opening, opening. It's easy to blow by it since we're using very, very tiny measurements. 2.36, let's go a little further. 2.4, see if I can get that 0.1 millimeters. Boom, okay. So now if we look at our gauge, we're exactly at top dead center right now. So that, by the book, is how you time the intake gauge. So uh, hopefully that wasn't as complex as you guys thought. So here's the thing. That is the easiest way to do it, and it happens to also be the by-the-book Ferrari way. So now what we're going to do is we're going to verify that it's timed up by looking at the intake center line. So if you remember I told you the cam lobe, if we spin around and look at it here. So if you look here at a cam lobe, you can see how it has a peak onto it. It's very hard to actually catch that peak. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a measurement on the way up and a measurement on the way down average them together and that'll give us the intake, the lobe center line. So this is method two and I'm gonna use this for verification. So we can pick literally any arbitrary number on the way up. So I'm gonna pick something probably about 10 or 15 degrees on one side and 10 or 15 degrees on the other side. So uh, anyway, the intake lobe center line is about 103 degrees on this. So now you can see the valves opening, opening. So we're gonna stop somewhere around, I know it opens about nine and a half millimeters. We're gonna stop somewhere around the eight millimeter mark. Well, I missed eight, so let's go to 8.1, how about that? And remember, I'm just picking these kind of arbitrarily. All right, we'll do 8.11. So 8.11's matching up exactly with, looks like 65 on the gauge. So we're gonna write down the number 65. Now we're gonna go past the top of the lobe. So as you can see, it comes up, valves at its max opening right there, kind of dwells for a while. Now we're gonna find 8.11 on the way down. So the valve is closing right now. We're gonna to try to stop it right at 
Now, obviously we're assuming here that the lobes are symmetrical, which is a pretty safe assumption, but that's why we're relying on the Ferrari uh, book method as our number one, and this is just to verify it. So it looks like we're at 142. So we're gonna average those two numbers together. Alexa, what is 65 plus 142? 65 plus 142 is 207. Alexa, what is 207 divided by 2? 207 divided by 2 is 103.5. Okay, so 103 is supposed to be the middle. We're at 103.5, so a half degree off. So that is telling us that this intake is timed pretty much perfectly, within a half degree. And um, so anyway, now it's time to move on to the exhaust. Now we've moved on to the exhaust side. It doesn't matter which one you use, one or two. Sometimes, just to double check, I'll use both just to make sure I didn't put it on the wrong spot. Kind of takes away some of the... Uh, the what ifs. Anyway, so what we're going to do is again the same thing. The number we're looking for this time, as per the Ferrari method, is on um, when the valve is closing, we're looking for 2.29 millimeters. When it's on 2.29 millimeters, it should stop at the top dead center. So right now we got the valve closing. As we come around, we need to make sure we stop right at 2.29. All right, here we go. 2.9, 2.7. Boom, 2.29. All right, so looking at this, I'm showing it basically right at maybe a half degree. So that again is within spec. So now we're just gonna verify that with the lobe center line. So on this one, if we look down here, let me spin this around for you guys. All right, so the exhaust is going to again start opening right about here. The exhaust center line is 110 degrees, which on this wheel, since it's on the back side, it's going to hit 250. So we're going to take two arbitrary numbers on either side of that 250, maybe like here and here, average them together to see if the lobe center line lines up with 250. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter what number you use. I suggest kind of stopping at maybe an even number. You know, let's just do 8.9. Boom. Okay, don't move. Now we're going to write that number down. Looks like we're at 223. All right. So 223. Now we're going to go over the top of the hump. And then we need to go down to 8.9 on the wave down. Boom. So we have 223 coming up. This one's showing uh, 279. Alexa, what is 279 plus 223? 279 plus 223 is 502. Alexa, what is 502 divided by 2? 502 divided by 2 is 251. All right, so averaging those numbers, we got 251. So we are 1 degree past. So basically, it looks like we are within the spec. Okay, guys, so now we've got bank 1 done. I need to move over and start doing bank to but as you can see it's not that bad especially when you just find top dead center and then use just the ferrari method of uh either the 2.41 on the intake or 2.29 on there and uh line it up uh if you have a problem and you're off that brings you to these little pins each little pin i believe if you move it gives you 1.5 degrees when you move it into the next hole now there you can actually rotate the whole thing and find other holes but generally 1.5 is going to be the easiest method you're going to get and you do that by kind of loosening the tensioner and just moving the pin and kind of tapping it into the next hole anyway i gotta get on a bank too because i want to get this motor back in the car asap anyway guys thanks for watching and next video is coming up soon that's good